Hello and welcome to this virtual Commonwealth Club program. My name is Dan Ashley, co-anchor of ABC7 News in San Francisco and a member of the Commonwealth Club Board of Governors. Presently, the Commonwealth Club has suspended its in-person programming because of the coronavirus and the shutdown, but hosting special virtual events like this one. You can learn more about our upcoming virtual events or become a member by visiting commonwealthclub.org. We are grateful for the generous support of our members and donors and hope you will consider making a donation online or text DONATE to 415-329-4231. We also encourage you to like, subscribe and share videos like this one with your friends and family. During our program, we will have time for your questions. Please submit those in the chat box because we'd love to hear from you. Now, it is my pleasure to introduce today's special guests, Jonathan Carl and Dr. Nasir Gami. Jonathan is the chief White House correspondent and chief Washington correspondent for ABC News and author of Front Row at the Trump Show. Throughout his career, Jonathan has covered every major beat in Washington, including the White House, Capitol Hill, the Pentagon, and the State Department. He's been with ABC News for more than 17 years and conducted Donald Trump's first network interview during the 2016 presidential campaign. Jonathan has won numerous journalism awards in his remarkable career, including an Emmy, the Walter Cronkite Award for National Individual Achievement, and the National Press Foundation's Everett McKinley Dirksen Award. He also serves as president of the White House Correspondents Association. Dr. Nasir Gami is a professor of psychiatry at Tufts University School of Medicine and a lecturer at Harvard Medical School. He has published more than 200 scientific articles and is author of A First Rate Madness, Uncovering the Links Between Leadership and Mental Illness. We hope you enjoy tonight's program with Jonathan, Jonathan Carl and Dr. Nasir Gami. Thanks, Dan. Um, John, it's a pleasure to be with you to have this conversation together. Great to be here with you. Thank you for doing it, Nasir. Thank you. And um, I appreciate all the, the people who are joining us online today. Um, one of the reasons you and I are having this conversation is because your book makes a surprising discovery that my book was required reading in the West Wing. And uh, we're <laughs> going to come back to that in a little while, but uh, yeah. uh, that's, uh, that's the link here. And uh, we'll, 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 get into that. But I want to start by um, talking to you some about your book in the first part of our conversation. For those who have not read your best-selling book, uh, can you give a little background for our viewers about uh, how long you've known Donald Trump and what led you to write the book? I, I wrote this book, Nasir, because I, I just, I had a story. I mean, just an unbelievable story that I had been compiling for years. And as I covered the 2016 presidential campaign and I covered the transition and Donald Trump becoming president. I was just so consumed with day to day news. I mean, every day seemed to have three or four stories that in the past might have dominated for a month news coverage. And they were all happening one after another. And it was hard to keep up. So I, I knew that ultimately I wanted to come back and tell this story. I first met Donald Trump back in 1994. Um, and I had a number of interactions with him dating back to that time, uh, until before he started to run for president, as, as, uh, was mentioned in the introduction, the, the first interview with him of the 2016, uh, presidential cycle. And I had a relationship with him and I had a series of experiences that made good stories, you know, back when he was just a developer, but now he's president of the United States. So I wanted first and foremost to tell this story not this is not my book was not meant to be written as uh an indictment of of trump or you know and certainly not not in praise of donald trump it was to tell the story of this unbelievable uh journey that i took to the white house and donald trump took to the white house and i i my goal in the book was to write something that would kind of survive the news cycle because the news cycle is so rapid, it, you know, it, 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 book, books on Trump come out one after another, stories, big stories, big news, big news developments. But I wanted to write something that if you came from another planet in 20 or 40 or 50 years and you came down and you said, what, 
and, and you ask the question, what was that Donald Trump stuff? What was that all about? I would hope that somebody would be able to hand you my book and say, this gives you a little bit of a sense of how it happened and what it was like. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Well, you definitely do that. You definitely do that. And um, I think you have a unique perspective because you knew uh, Donald Trump 20 years before he became president and, and afterwards. Uh, what, what's your sense of that? Do you think he's the same guy before and after? Was he just, as you wrote, you know, a guy who exaggerated things, but it was all in fun and people liked him before and, and now it's not so much fun and it's sort of dangerous? And is he the same person? Is he a different person? What's your take on that? I have two meetings that I describe, one at the very beginning of the book and one at the very end. The one at the very beginning is the first time I met Donald Trump, which was back in 1994. And I was a young reporter for the New York Post. And I called him, really cold called him. He had no idea who I was at all. And um, I just called the general number at the Trump organization and said, hey, I want to talk to Donald Trump. <laughs> and and I, I got through to him actually quite quickly, even though I was a total nobody at, at, a, at, a, at a tabloid newspaper in New York. I got through to him. Um, it was a crazy story. Don, uh, Michael Jackson and Lisa Marie Presley had just gotten secretly married and they were staying at Trump Tower. And I wanted to do a story about why the most famous newlyweds in the world would begin their honeymoon at Trump Tower. Uh, and he loved that story, obviously. And I spent an hour with him running around Trump Tower. He showed me everything. He showed me where uh, where they were staying, introduced me to their bodyguards, the secret passageways underneath Trump Tower, where they could leave to avoid the crowds outside, uh, where all the other you know famous people that had apartments in Trump Tower lived, all this stuff, his own apartment. And I spent like an hour with him. I still have a photo. Uh, it's in the book. One of my favorite parts of the book is actually I went through and collected all these photos over the years. But I had this photo from 1994, me and Donald Trump in his apartment on the on the 68th floor of Trump Tower. And it's a striking how much he looks the way he does now. Same expression you see in all the photos he takes with people now at the White House behind the Resolute desk. The same long tie, a little too long, dark suit. He's, you know, he weighs more now, the suits are a little bigger now, but, but same, everything about him seems the same. So there was that meeting. And at the end of the book, I describe a meeting where I was, basically summoned to the Oval Office by, by Trump um, just last September because uh, he was really upset about a story I had done. And uh, I ended up having a meeting that lasted nearly an hour with him in the Oval Office. And it's a, it's a wild, surreal meeting that I described for the first time uh, in the book. But as I'm talking with him and he's sitting on the, you know, at the Resolute desk, he's the president of the United States, by the way, there's all kinds of things happening in the world. North Korea has started testing missiles again at the time of this meeting. Uh, it's, it's, it's just after the shootings in El Paso uh, and Dayton. Uh, so you have all the concerns about that. There's a hurricane bearing down on, on, on Florida, five, Category 5 hurricane. And here I am spending nearly an hour because he's concerned about one line in my story that ran the night before. You know, and but the, but you know, this, the, the conversation goes in a thousand different directions. And it just struck me as I was sitting there looking at him, sitting at the Resolute in the Oval Office, this was the same guy that I was with in 1994, running around talking about Michael Jackson and Lisa Marie Presley. And the way he's talking, the, his entire approach to everything is almost exactly the same. It's serial exaggeration. He's you know, um, concerned above all about making himself the center of the story. Um, he's, he's the same guy, but the stakes are entirely different. It doesn't matter if you are not telling the truth, for instance, and you're, you know, just a guy that wants to get in the papers and, you know, you're trying to sell apartments or buildings, you know, it's one thing, but if you're president of the United States, an entirely different situation. So that's, that, that really, struck me. Um, and I, to, to think back, and that's kind of what the book's about, to be there in 1994, I'm like a young tabloid reporter, one of the most junior reporters at the New York Post, which is the fourth largest circulation paper in New York City. So, you know, I mean, and to think that I would ultimately end up at the White House was pretty inconceivable. And that I would end up at the White House at the same time that he would end up at the White House as president but same guy, ultimately the same guy. 
Yeah, that's that's a really interesting observation. I mean, the, firstly, there's this parallel rise of, of both of you, uh, which is an interesting thing in the book. But uh, the fact that he's the same guy is interesting. You know, um, Lord David Owen, who was a British foreign minister in the late 70s and is a neurologist, wrote a book called The Hubris Syndrome uh, after he observed that Tony Blair completely changed, he felt, in his personality before and after power, before he was very rational and listened to lots of opinions and so on. And afterwards, he just didn't do that anymore and just went his own way in the Iraq war, for instance. And same thing with uh, George W. Bush. So uh, Lord Owen's perspective was that power corrupts in this way. Some people, uh, their personality changes. But sounds like maybe in this case, President's case, he already had the hubris to begin with, and then maybe there wasn't much room for, for change. He, he, he certainly had the hubris. I, I think there is one thing that did evolve as he as he was president. When he first came to Washington, he was somebody, Donald Trump was somebody who had barely ever visited Washington, let alone have any experience in Washington. Mm-hmm. So he created this, you know, he hired this staff around him. And you remember Reince Priebus was made chief of staff, but the day they announced Reince Priebus, he was third person mentioned in the um, <laughs> in the press release because he was also announcing that Steve Bannon was his uh, chief strategist, and uh, you know Jared Kushner was going to have an elevated role in the in the West Wing as well. But he had these people around him, and he I think he, even though he had the bravado which he has always had, um, he, he felt he didn't know Washington. He needed to lean on somebody like Reince Priebus who, by the way, actually didn't have much Washington experience either. He'd been the chairman of the RNC, but before that, he was a guy in Wisconsin, you know, local party guy. Mm-hmm. Um, but he, he asked, he sought advice. He didn't always take the advice, but he felt that he needed to. And now I think, and I described this evolution in the book, I mean, he's at a point where he thinks that he doesn't need any advice. Mm-hmm. Uh, and every time he looks at somebody was going to give him advice. He said, well, you were the same people, especially experienced people, especially experienced Republicans. You were the people that said I was going to lose. You were the people that said I couldn't pull any of this off. The hell with all, you know, he just, the, 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 there, I got a chapter in the book called No Guardrails. There were some guardrails in the beginning. Those guardrails were completely gone uh, within a year and a half of the Trump presidency. And now uh, the, the remnants aren't even visible. So I wonder, in a way, maybe he's he is adhering to the pattern that Owen Owen yeah. described in some ways. Um, so I mean, I think let's let's take a step into it a little bit more. A, a, a standard question always is with this president: How did he get elected to begin with? And and you have a chapter in your book about a black called Black Swan about how this is that kind of unusual, rare event with major consequences. And you talk about how the Republican National Committee had this meeting with that was not on the record at the time where they were predicting he would lose badly. Yep. But that one of the uh, pollsters that you that was, uh, I guess, at ABC News that was doing a unique statistical analysis actually got it exactly right. So maybe let's start with your your description of how was it that he actually got elected? Well, First of all, I think nobody thought he was going to win. And I think that included Donald Trump. Two days after the election, I describe in the book, I happened to be in the Oval Office when Donald Trump first met uh, Barack Obama. And this is the one great exception. This was the one time I saw Donald Trump where he actually did appear. And people are surprised when I use this word, but he, he, he appeared humble. He appeared like he was a little blown away by his surroundings and about the responsibility he was about to inherit. We were brought in with the press after he had met with Obama for a full hour. And it was Obama's meeting. Obama was in charge. You know, three days ago, I think Donald Trump never thought that this meeting was ever going to happen, anything like it. And here he was realizing he was about to get the keys to American democracy. And I took photos with my, um, with my own phone. There's some photos that other you know, obviously there are a lot of photographers in there, but I go back and I look through these, these pictures and his posture is different. The look on his face is different. He's, it's the one meeting where he's, that I've, I think that, he, that I've ever seen him in where he wasn't in charge because it was Obama's meeting, Obama's still president. Uh, but that quickly changed. But in terms of how, you know, how he won, we, we, we did, look, I think that it was the great, it's, it was the greatest upset in American political history. And I called it a black swan event. 
which means incredibly rare events. Um, uh, it, it was a combination of um, Hillary Clinton's weakness as a candidate, uh, the combination of, of combined with the fact that nobody really thought he was going to win. So a lot of people who would vote against him but didn't like Hillary very much decided just to stay home. I mean, why bother? She's going to win anyway. Um, he won the, you know, by, by, by narrow margins in states that, uh, you know, nobody thought he really had a chance. Wisconsin, Michigan, Pennsylvania. Um, he, um, there were, there were a series of events at the very end of the campaign, including, you know, the, the, the famous case of James Comey reopening the email investigation because of what was found on Anthony Weiner's uh, computer. Uh, but the, the one person you mentioned, and I'm glad you bring it up because it hasn't gotten enough attention there. We, we had, um, somebody in our polling unit who was experimenting with an entirely different way of analyzing the polling data. And, and the first thing I'll say is that virtually every news organization in America was doing it wrong, including ABC, all of us, we were measuring the wrong thing. Uh, major networks, major newspapers had what they call tracking polls, which meant we would we would every day we would you know do another poll and, and we would average three or four days together, drop off the last day, add the new one, and then you could see how the race was evolving. And but these were national numbers, like how many you know where the standing was across all of America, uh, registered likely voters. That's a meaningless stat. I mean, Donald Trump lost the popular vote and he's in the White House, so it means nothing to tell you who is winning nationally. But that's what we're all measuring because it's a lot harder to go in and do all the states and do all. So what, what this guy did, though, is because the tracking poll takes place over two weeks, it's got a lot of interviews. And we know every person that's interviewed, the pollsters get all the, you know, where are you from? What, what. So what he did is he went through and he extrapolated all the polling data um, from each of the states. So. Every time somebody in you know voted for Michigan, he 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 had, had put it in the Michigan. You know the, the Iowa voters are here, the Florida, and then at the end of it all, the tracking poll ends right. You know uh, I think it was two days before the election or the day before the election. He puts it all together and say where do all the states uh, stand? And he had every state right except for one, and it added up to a victory for Donald Trump. Now it was experimental; it was not proven. We did not publish his data. Uh, mm -hmm. But I have it. I saw it. I was at the briefing. And trust me, they'll be looking a lot more at his analysis. Okay. Sounds like which one we need to look at next time. Around. Yeah, yeah. Um, well, before we get to the re-election, I want to just discuss one main, seemed to me like a main theme of your book, which is this question of truth. And you called it the assault on, on truth and this fake news type of this talking discussion. Maybe you can share with us your general thoughts about that as a kind of a general idea that that you have? Well, I, I found this old interview that Trump did when he was 37 years old uh, with a sports writer for the New York Times named Ira Burkow. And he said, um, creating illusions is to a certain degree what we must do. That was Donald Trump as a 30 something year old person. And that's continues to be what he does. I mean, he, you know, I talk about Trump Tower itself as kind of a case study because I told you I was in his apartment on the 68th floor. Trump Tower only has 58 stories. <laughs> it's an illusion. Yeah. The fifth floor ends, and the floor above the fifth floor is the 14th floor. Voila! You suddenly have 10 more stories. You know, your 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 tenth your top story looks like it's it's, it's still the same building. Yeah. Um, so uh, you know, he's been exaggerating. He's been, you know, I talk about um Donald Trump is somebody who will lie for almost any reason. Uh Another story, Rick Riley, a, a legendary sports columnist, uh, was with Sports Illustrated at the time, and he went to do a, a profile on Trump at one of his golf tournaments. And Trump kept on introducing him as the president of Sports Illustrated. And Riley would like say, wait, I'm not the, why do you say that? No, I'm not the president. I'm, I'm, I'm a columnist. And then finally, Riley pulled him aside and said, why do you keep lying about me? And Trump said, it sounds better. Sounds better. He'll lie if it sounds better. He'll lie to make you feel better. He'll lie to make himself feel better. He'll lie to, you know, make everybody in the room feel like they're part of something bigger and, and larger than it is. He'll lie to make a deal. He'll lie to win a race. He'll, doesn't matter. 
Um, but what I worry about is he's done that on one side. And then the other thing he's done with these relentless attacks on the press, uh, calling real news fake news. Um, he once said in a, in a speech to the veterans of foreign wars, he, he told supporters, he said, don't believe what you are seeing in the newspapers. Don't believe what you are watching. Um, you know, he's literally telling them, don't believe your own eyes. Uh, so he's he's relentlessly waged this war against real solid, you know, uh, against an, an independent free press, which is fine. Every president complains about the press, but this is different. He's undermining. He's calling things that are true false. He's calling things that are real fake. And he's convincing about a third of the country, maybe maybe more than a third of the country, that they really can't believe anything they see in a newspaper. And, right. and then at the same time, because he himself is saying so many things that are untrue, you have maybe nearly half the country that won't believe anything that comes out of the White House. So you have a situation where there are different realities. You know, Daniel Patrick Moynihan said, you're entitled to your own opinion, but you're not entitled to your own facts. And now we have a society where people don't agree on day and night. I mean, it's like totally different versions of reality. I think that's really dangerous. Right, right. You know, it's interesting to think about how much of that is, uh, is he a symptom of a larger cultural problem as opposed to being the problem as you know, there's been debates in universities, for instance, a lot over the last few decades about facts versus social constructions uh, of reality, that kind of thing. And a, a bit of relativism that's gotten in there. Yes. Um, postmodernism. It's like a, didn't yeah. want to say the word postmodernism. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> exactly. And, this is stuff. This is stuff that I was dealing with in my in my college uh, literature classes. You know, not uh, not not at the White House. Now it's now it's not in college literature anymore. Yeah. Daily yeah. Lunch, uh, so, but uh, you, you made the point in the book, and this really struck me in the beginning. Uh, you made the point that yeah, Trump has a lot of support among people who will look at these little lies, say on on Twitter, these little tweets, and say, yeah, but. Put that in the context of all these prior presidents who didn't do all that, but failed in various ways. So it's not as bad as, say, uh, George W. Bush telling the country that there were weapons of mass destruction in Iraq and taking us to war when there wasn't. And yeah. so they, they give the current president a pass for these little lies. And when I read that, I, I um, struck me because I know the book was mostly written and, and came out before the pandemic and before the current um, massive social racial change that's going on. And uh, with the pandemic in particular, we have over 100,000 deaths now. So can we really say the same thing as we might have been able to, some supporters might have been able to say before? I wanted to raise that question to you. Yeah, no, it's a, it's a, it's a really good question because until the pandemic, Donald Trump had actually benefited from something that not many presidents get this luxury three years of no major crises. I mean, there were a lot of crises in the White House, but they were self-created either by the president himself or by his, by his staff. And he had the investigations, he had a lot of, you know, all of that, all the, all the stuff, the, the, the stuff surrounding, for instance, the, the child separation policy at the border or the, or the travel ban. And these were, these were crises, but they were created from within. With the pandemic for the first time, you have a major crisis, perhaps the, one of the greatest of our lifetimes, if not maybe the greatest, um, fall on his lap. And then followed on with all we have seen since the killing of George Floyd. So now suddenly Trump has to deal with crises that are not simply self-created. Right. But what, what I was trying to explain is that a lot of people who support Donald Trump will look and they'll watch and actually they'll watch, say, the cable channels, two or two of the three cable channels. And they'll say, look, all the coverage is about all the horrible things Donald Trump did today. They never once paused to talk about anything that he's actually accomplished. Um, and until recently, you would say, you know, the economy, um, uh, you know, some of the stuff he did on on criminal justice reform, uh, you know, you know, bill that had been you know, long advocated by people on both Democrats and, and Republicans and, and, and didn't get anywhere, and Trump signed it into law. 
um, you know, you focus on these on these things. You know, Trump's done a lot of stupid things. Maybe there's some I'm channeling some of the people that, that, that would support him. Sure, he says, well, I you know, wish he wouldn't tweet. He says things that are outrageous. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But, you know, did he ever like get us into a war over false intelligence? Has he done anything that as, as really as damaging as what Donald Trump, as, as what uh, George Bush did? Or some of the colossal mistakes that some of his predecessors did. Vietnam. Um, but now the, so I wrote that in the book, but now the question is, well, has he with this? Now, I don't, you know, I don't know. I mean, he didn't, 100,000 people didn't die because of Donald Trump, but you could certainly raise really serious questions about the way he, you know, the way he handled it, the way, the way he's handled this crisis, obviously. Uh, there was that recent, book uh, book <laughs> there was that recent analysis from the, the one of the UK um, medical groups, which said that if they had uh, started the quarantine about a week earlier, they would have saved half the lives who died. If you apply that to the U.S., you could argue, you know, this is a person who was in denial from January to March. Yeah, that's half fifty thousand lives or more potentially. Yeah. Um, but this brings me to, I think, the uh, maybe a segue to to, to talk <laughs> about about the question of whether he's a good crisis leader, which is what my book was about about what makes for a good crisis leadership. And let's uh, let's describe, you know, what you discovered, which was that when Chief of Staff Mick Mulvaney took over. Uh, after John Kelly and 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 uh, the prior folks that were there, he had the White House staff go to Camp David and gave them my book. Uh, but I'll let you tell the story. Uh, yeah, he he, 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 had, he had just become um, a chief of staff, and he figured the best way to get started was to invite all the senior advisors to the president to Camp David for a weekend retreat. And he and he held your book up. I'm told. Uh, and read some passages. He read some of what you wrote um, about um, about FDR. Um, uh, there's a scene in, in in your book that he reads from describing FDR talking to, uh, to, to 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 some of his top advisors after Pearl Harbor, and he's kind of he's wandering in his discussion all over the place, and he's like it doesn't seem focused, and um, and uh, and he and he uh, Describes the way the way he kind of summed up your your book is um, some of the, the the best leaders in times of crisis. Some of the best leaders have been uh, people who had mental illness. Uh, McClellan was a perfectly sane individual and a horrible general, um, but Sherman, who was mentally ill, mm -hmm. was a very successful Civil War general. Uh, Winston Churchill was, you know, all over the place. Uh, Neville Chamberlain, perfectly sane guy. Who was the better leader uh, uh, for um, for the UK uh, dealing with uh, with the irrationality of, of of Nazi Germany? So he's he's making this case, and and what what blew me away about this finding was, first of all, you wrote your book in 2011, so you wrote your book before Donald Trump. Uh, you know, before Barack Obama was reelected. I mean, you wrote it way before uh, Trump's running for president. You don't mention Donald Trump. Um, but the point that Mulvaney is making clearly is you may think that Trump is crazy, that the guy we're working for is insane, is, is mentally ill. Forgive me for using mentally ill. Um, but maybe he is. And maybe that's a good thing. And what you think is, is, is crazy is actually genius. And the corollary to that is, this is the new chief of staff, acting chief of staff, is don't try to channel the president, follow him. Don't try to like, because the, the previous chief of staff, John Kelly, was always trying to keep Trump within those guardrails I was talking about. Now Mulvaney was saying, sounds nuts to you, but let me tell you, it's genius. So, so let me ask you, um, well, can I, before we get to Donald Trump, can I just ask a very basic question? First of all, is, is that summary of, of, of your argument kind of close to, close to accurate? Yeah, well, definitely. It's accurate. I, I can, I can flesh it out a little bit more for sure. you, the viewers who, who haven't read my book. Um, the, 
the basic idea I had was that there are some benefits to some psychiatric conditions. I, I see it in my own patients. I treat a lot of people with depression and manic depressive illness, bipolar illness, who are businessmen, entrepreneurs, politicians, successful people. Uh, and so I know that it, it's helpful to them. I see it in their lives. And when I got into researching it, I realized that there's this research in psychology and psychiatry that shows some benefits. For instance, people who have depression are more realistic than people who are not depressed. It's part of normal mental health to overestimate yourself, to view things somewhat optimistically. Psychologists call this mild positive illusion. And that's a good thing in, in normal life. But uh, if you're a crisis leader and the slightest lack of realism could lead to a war or to a pandemic or whatever, that could actually be a problem. Even having normal mental health could be a problem. Um, people who are depressed are more empathic towards others than normal, mentally healthy persons. People who are manic, and, and we all know what depression is, mania is the opposite. It's the state of being sped up and fast in your thinking, movement, and feeling. People like that don't sleep a lot. They talk fast. They're distractible. They have high sexual drives. They have high physical energy. They make rapid decisions, sometimes impulsive. They have high self-esteem. Oh, that sounds familiar. Sound familiar? Yeah. <laughs> and uh, it's very obvious, in fact, and, 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 it's, and it's very common in entrepreneurs. And um, be, because they are creative, mania is associated with creativity. It's also found a lot in writers, artists, poets, and so on. Um, and there's also research that shows that people who are manic are more resilient to trauma or stress than normal people. They bounce back more easily. So if you're a manic depressive leader, you're de realistic, empathic, creative, and resilient. And that makes you Winston Churchill or maybe uh, Franklin Roosevelt uh, or maybe G General Sherman. Uh, it also could make you Adolf Hitler, who also had bipolar illness. So it's, it's not a sign of good leadership in the sense that the beliefs of the leader necessarily would be something you, someone might agree with. We all have different political views. But for the purposes of that leader, these traits can attract followers and make them effective. That was the idea, but the idea was also had a corollary, which was that that was the case in crises. Because when you're in a crisis, you need realism and creativity and, and resilience. But in the average, normal, daily life, you don't need all that. You know, when things are going fine and there's peace and prosperity and the trains are running on time and the economy is doing great, you just need a manager who isn't going to rock the boat and the past will predict the future. He needs to get along with people. That's all people want. And that's normal. That's what normal mental health gives you. And so my, my point was that in times of peace and prosperity, normal mentally healthy people are better leaders than people with manic depressive illness in particular. But in times of crises, actually, when you look at the great leaders, they tended to be manic depressive. That was the idea. So how do you, uh, just one basic question before we turn to Donald Trump and your assessment of, of him. When, when, you're, when you're looking at Churchill, you, you also talk about Abraham Lincoln. I assume that the Adolf Hitler chapter was one that, um, that Mulvaney might have uh, glossed over, um, but uh, how do you how do you make that assessment that, for instance, that that uh, that, that Winston Churchill had some mental illness? Yeah, and that that's kind of a, a, a central issue with this kind of what's called psychohistory, um, yeah. using psychological psychiatric ideas for history. Um, there are different ways of doing it, and I think there are better and worse ways of doing it. The, the, the worst ways are to take, for instance, Freudian speculative ideas and guess about it in someone's psyche. I mean, that's hard enough to do with a patient who's sitting in front of you on a couch for hours on end, for years on end as a, as a therapist. It's really um, not something that one can do at, at a distance from somebody else. And that's probably a lot of what's behind some of, um, you know, it's, what's out there in the profession, which is the, there's a thing called the Goldwater rule that after Barry Goldwater ran for president, he sued some uh, a magazine that had done a poll of psychiatrists who said they thought he was unfit to be president uh, mentally um, because they really couldn't make that judgment at a distance. Uh, some of them said he had schizophrenia, for instance. With the current presidents, a lot of people will say he's narcissistic, he's psychopathic. They come up with these labels, which really are about interpreting the internal psychological experience of someone. And that is hard to do. And I'm, I'm not supportive of that. But what you can't and, and you don't like the term narcissism. Um, I don't. I don't. Because it, it does imply a psychological interpretation of somebody's mental, internal mental state. 
Like, yeah. I'm not going to guess how you feel internally in your mental state in a general way. I don't know you well enough for that. And you can't guess me. Um, that kind of thing is really something that is clinical. It has to happen in a private psychiatrist or, or clinician's office. But what is not r- limited to the doctor's office is if somebody is severely depressed, they stop eating and sleeping. They don't get out of bed. They don't laugh. Um, they get suicidal and they might kill themselves. That doesn't take much interpretation. That's, those are really objective physical signs. And when someone's manic, as we talked about, they're the opposite. They're hyperactive, don't sleep, and so on. If he's sleeping four hours a night, that's a manic symptom. You don't need to interpret anything. That's more objective. And that's why I think not all psychiatric illnesses, but some, like manic depression, can be diagnosed. And in this, I disagree with the American Psychiatric Association's principle on this. And I've had, I'm part of the association. We've had yeah. symposia professionally about it. We debate it, but I, I think it's um, it's not a limiting factor if your if your diagnosis is based on more or less objective criteria that can be proven. So, um, so B- Bill Clinton famously slept like no more than four hours a night. Uh, had some of those uh, those other other uh, characteristics you described. Uh, yeah. did, did, how does he fit into this? Yeah, I, I, so the, there's a couple ways you can have this, these symptoms. Uh, I call it the Goldilocks principle, where if you have a small amount, they're helpful to you. If you have too much of these symptoms, they're harmful. And if you have, and you're mentally complete, it's also harmful in terms yeah. of crisis leadership. So, um, you know, mostly people think about these symptoms in terms of patients who may have very severe symptoms. And I treat a lot of patients for 25 years. Uh, may have severe depression, severe bipolar illness, they often are not very functional. But people that have mild depression and mild manic symptoms can be quite functional. And in in fact, some people have them all the time as part of their personality. So Mm -hmm. we know about some people are a little down all the time, we call that dysthymia. Some people are a little up or a little manic all the time, high energy, high Mm -hmm. sexual drive, charisma, creativity. We call that hyperthymia, which is uh, the kinds of What's, what I see is, is, is consistent with what you see in the case of President Clinton and also the current president. And it's really common, like I said, among leaders and entrepreneurs, for instance. When I wrote uh, First Raid Madness in 2011, I wanted to write about an entrepreneur in addition to the political and military leaders. And if I had picked Donald Trump, I would have been a genius, I suppose. <laughs> it but would have been perfect. <laughs> it would have been perfect. I just needed to okay. So, you know, so, so think, assess, uh, assess Donald Trump. Donald, is, Donald, I picked Ted Turner. Ted Turner, right. Yeah. Ted Turner is, in my view, more or less a Democratic Donald Trump. I mean, personality-wise, they're very similar, but good. So, so let me just ask point blank, assess Donald Trump. Do, 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 does, he have, does he have mental illness? I, see, I don't, wouldn't use the phrase mental illness because, um, you know, there are mental illnesses that are very severe, like schizophrenia. We're not talking about that. Yep. And uh, personality traits really are not illnesses. They're variations on the norm. Hyperthymia, for instance, being mildly manic all the time is a temperament, we call it. And it's related to manic depression, which is an illness. It's biologically related, but it's not the same thing. So I'm, just, I'm, just, I'm just going from, from your book, which uh, with, 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 the, with the subtitle, Mental the illness. Leadership yeah. and Mental Illness. I know. The subtitle <laughs> was not my favorite, but, uh, <laughs> but it's it's... It's not, a, yeah, it always requires a little clarification. Right, but, right, right. Um, so but I was, so, so uh, to yeah, assess him, what, what do you, yeah. what, how does Donald Trump fit into your, so, your analysis? Based here? on what we know, and we have to go by what we know, because uh, there may be something that he hasn't told us or he's hidden from the public. But from what we know, he has mild manic symptoms all the time as part of his personality. Decreased need for sleep, talkativeness, racing thoughts, et cetera, impulsivity, distractibility, high physical energy. Those are all manic symptoms, high self-esteem as part of your personality. Now, he doesn't appear to get into episodes that last for months on end where they get really severe and out of control. He also doesn't appear to have periods of severe depression where he's non-functional for weeks or months on end. And and at least we don't know of that. And that's what you would see in full-blown bipolar illness or manic depressive illness. But what we have now is just the manic symptoms. And I think that the way that relates to his leadership is that having manic symptoms, but not any depression, actually only makes you half of a good crisis leader. It may make you creative and resilient, but it actually makes you unempathic, even less empathic than normal people, and much less than depressed people, and unrealistic, even less realistic than normal people, and much less than depressed people. 
And the kind of crisis leader you need when you have a pandemic where you really needed to be on the ball that's to start that quarantine a week earlier to save 50,000 lives is someone who's highly realistic and someone, the kind of leader you need when one more black man is killed by police under their knee is a highly empathic leader. And those are exactly the two traits that his hyperthymia denies him. So if you were to do that chapter now, what would you say about him? I would say that. I would say that that hyperthymic part, and I would just add a qualifier that, uh, as far as we know, that's the case. Now, if he's ever had a depressive episode 20 or 30 years ago, you know, that might change a little bit of the interpretation. But mm -hmm. uh, as far as we know, that's the case. In fact, recently I tried to, um, I've written this some in some places, uh, in, in, in various um, places online, some, some magazines. But it's been hard to publish these ideas in major media. And I have the same uh, reaction from some psychiatrist colleagues, uh, partly because there's a reluctance to address this issue of psychiatric or medical interpretations of a leader related to the Goldwater rule, for instance, uh, or other reasons. And recently, for instance, I, I wrote up these ideas and got to the last stage of near publication in a major media outlet. And in the last stage of editorial review, it was rejected. And the reason it was rejected was because I couldn't prove that the president had never been depressed. Mm -hmm. So the claim was, well, OK, he might be manic, but you can't prove he wasn't depressed. Therefore, we really don't know. We still don't know what mm -hmm. his situation is. And that's you know, proving a negative is almost impossible. But you, you have to go with what you have. Um, and I think, you know, it's consistent with what we see. We've had three years of him. If he had depression, we probably would have seen it in, a, in the public light by now. Um, so, yeah, I mean, when you when you told me about the uh, the book in Mick Mul and, and you didn't mention Mick Mulvaney. Mulvaney yeah, 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 yeah. Somebody yeah. in the White House had the book yeah. and you asked me what I thought and by email. This is what I wrote to you and you put it in the book. And I appreciate that you put my interpretation because. You know, it could the perspective I have could be misinterpreted. Um, it could be uh, taken in vain, as my editor said when I when I told him about all this. Because what I'm not saying is, if you have manic depression of some variety, you're going to be a great leader no matter what. Right. Uh, there are provisos and qualifiers to it, and you put that qualifier in the book. That, for instance, if it's very severe, like in the case of Hitler, it's not. It's very dangerous. And if it, and and the proviso I'm giving now is is if it's just part of it, if you just have the manic side and not the depressive side, you really suffer from not having the empathic, realistic leadership. And, and that could be dangerous in your view. And dangerous, yeah. And the other thing that has come up is, is people used to say, well, he's a good Christ, he's gonna be a good president because you know we have crises. But as you said, turns out those weren't crises. This is what a crisis feels like. Right. Today, you and me on Zoom, instead of being in the same room in San Francisco with 100,000 people dead and with riots happening on the streets every night for the last few weeks, this is what a crisis feels like. And this is when we're going to know if he's a good crisis leader or not. And, and that'll lead us to this reelection. Interesting. Well, we should probably get on. I know there are, there are a number yep. of questions that have come in. Let's see what we got here. Yeah, we have questions and, and the number for you. So if you don't mind, I'll, I'll read, okay. read one, one or two for you. Um, so would you say, what are three adjectives you would use to describe Donald Trump? Um, that's a tough one. Can we, get, can we come back to that? Okay. Uh, here's another tough one. I'm sorry, John. <laughs> given, given what you observe on a daily basis, do you believe our country and democracy will survive the Trump presidency? Uh, yes. Um, and. Um, I, I think that maybe the most important part of, of my book and the part that I struggled the most with um, is, is my very last chapter where I describe why I believe the current situation and it's not all Trump's doing uh, uh, is, is, is perilous. This moment is perilous. Um, perilous because we have become so deeply divided uh, that we don't agree on basic facts anymore. And if you don't agree on basic facts and on the nature of truth, it's hard to overcome those divisions, maybe impossible. 
uh, trust. Trust is a, a part of everything that makes our system work. Um, we trust our ability to go out and vote and elect leaders. And that if they are terrible leaders that we can have another election and vote them out. We, um, we trust that this piece of paper we hold in our hand is worth something because, well, because of the government that's backing it, you know, dollar bill, what's a dollar bill. Um, we, 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 we need to have some element of trust to, to, to make the system work. And to do that, you have to have some kind of an agreement about, I think, the nature of truth. And I think that that is what we're, it's in danger right now. And Trump's a big part of it. He's not the only part of it, but he's a big part of it. Um, but I also, um, I, 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 I have tremendous faith in, in our institutions. And that faith gets challenged every day. I'm not saying it doesn't. Uh, but if you look at what happened with the president's talk of invoking um, the Insurrection Act and sending active duty military into American streets, um, I think it's notable that our very military leaders stood up against that um, and wouldn't, I don't think would have carried out those you know, convinced him not to do that. And then I think made it pretty clear they would, they would resign rather than carry out an order like that. Um, I get a lot, a variation, a variant of that question is what happens if Trump loses? Will he, will he go voluntarily? Um, actually, <laughs> uh, Joe Biden was asked a variation of that question uh, by Trevor Noah um, and basically said, look, the military, we have good people who will go in and calmly carry him, escort him out the door. I had somebody who worked for Donald Trump at a very senior level tell me the same thing when I asked the question, which makes me think, by the way, was Joe Biden talking to the same person I was talking to? But the person I was talking to uh, added another um, very vivid imagery. He said, Donald Trump could chain himself to the resolute desk and people would very calmly clip cut the chains and walk them out the door. Um, so I don't think that's going to happen. And I, and, and I believe that Donald Trump's, um, you know, he, he, I call it the Trump show because that's the way he sees it. He is, he is broadcasting the greatest reality television show the world has ever seen. He talks about the ratings. He talks about the reviews. That's what he talks about when he's talking about media coverage, he consumes more media than, than, than you or I have ever dreamed of consuming. You know, he told me at one point that TiVo, the, the first uh, DVR was the greatest invention, one of the greatest inventions ever because he could watch all the shows, you know, he could, and I've gotten calls from him, maybe like a, a delay after something I have done on, on Good Morning America. Maybe I won't hear, it goes on at seven o'clock, I'll hear from him at 10 because he's watched all the other shows first and then he got around to GMA and then he didn't really any calls. So he, he consumes news, he sees it like a show and, um, I don't think he wants to actually be the big strong leader. I think that he wants to play the big strong leader. Um, so, uh, look, if if he loses, he'll he'll do what every other president has lost before him. I believe. Yeah. So I, I, that's um, it's it's interesting. I, we have a, a lot of questions coming in about different characteristics of the president. Let me just take one um, and then I'll ask you in the, uh, one of these, but I want to take one on a uh, comment on Trump's mother and her thinking that he could never do wrong. Um, yeah, I'll just comment on that. And then you can also, I, I think one of the points I would make in relation to that question, that question is, you know, my perspective on say how manic or depressive symptoms, which are mood states affect uh, a leader is not that it's the whole story. I think it's an important part of the story, but it's not the whole story. There are other aspects to a person that are relevant. Uh, some people grow up in very religious families. Some people grow up in very secular families. Some people grow up wealthy. Some people grow up poor. There are all sorts of cultural variations, um, education. So there are lots of things that affect um, who a person becomes, not just the manic depressive. But I, I do think the manic depressive traits are necessary for great crisis leadership, but they they're not sufficient. There, there's other things that may also be needed or that may explain the person. And, and one thing that I think is relevant to this president uh, that you've brought up many times is the, the issue around truth and lying. And, and, and 
if someone's manic, that doesn't tend to make you lie. People like that don't lie. It's not part of the mania to lie. There's that's something else that may have to do with whether his mother, you know, built him up so much that he felt that way, or or coming from Queens versus Manhattan and having a chip on his shoulder. There are other aspects, but I thought I'd mention that and and see if you had any comments as well, John. Yeah, I I, I honestly don't know. I mean, Trump very infrequently talks about his parents but he does on occasion and um and talks about his brother fred who died um uh as the main reason why he doesn't drink um because because fred was an alcoholic um but i maybe it's because it's not my area i've never really I've never really tried to dive into what we could learn about his upbringing and how that tells us about where he is now. Although it's very interesting. I sent you that I sent you an email about this today, I think, right. There's a, uh, there's a book coming out um, by Donald Trump's niece, by his brother, brother Fred's daughter, I, I believe uh, coming out later this summer. Um, and uh, it sounds, looks like it's going to be quite an interesting book. It's going to talk about their upbringing in Queens because she was, she witnessed a lot of it. Right. Um, so maybe we'll learn a little bit more, but I, I think that's one, I think that Donald Trump in some ways is the most transparent president we've ever had. I mean, we know kind of his day-to-day minute by minute thoughts uh, through Twitter uh, among other things. Um, but he doesn't, he doesn't reveal much about, about his upbringing. He really doesn't. And, yeah, that's a big black box. Yeah, but it'd be interesting to see if if his niece fills in some of those holes or what what yeah. that relationship's like. I mean, we don't know. I mean, but, I'm kind of fascinated about Donald Trump's sister, the judge. You know, um, mm-hmm. you just don't you just don't don't hear. Yeah, I mean, I don't know. You know, one of the things that I learned in in, in my research was um, a 50 year rule, which is, it seemed to me that it took about 50 years for the truth to come out about a leader, usually after all the people who were that leader's peers and family and so on passed away. Uh, the oral history archives would get open, the medical records would get open. In the case of John Kennedy, for instance, his medical records weren't opened until 10 years ago or so. And it made it clear that he did have Addison's disease and he did have severe depression and he was suicidal. He was even treated with antipsychotics in the White House. Mm-hmm. None of that was known. Uh, it, it took a decade or two till a Churchill after Churchill's death that his depression, his doctor published memoirs about Churchill's depression. And even then he was, um, I think he was sued by Churchill's family. So it takes a while for things to come out. And, and so it's not surprising that we don't know a lot about um, the current president's childhood. And a part of the problem is that, you know, by the time you find out about somebody, it's irrelevant to, in terms of... <laughs> Right. Current political decision making. But it will be interesting to see, because if, if I'm right about the manic depression, if there is an aspect of this in him, it's a highly genetic illness. So there should be other people in the family who have it, too. Some will have it more severely. So you might have cases even of suicide or such. Mm-hmm. And you see that in the case of all the most of the leaders that I wrote about. Um, and that's what you would expect. But again, when you find out about it can be can be quite delayed. But we'll see. It's interesting. Um, Another question. Um, You talk a lot. I think this will get into some detail in your from your book. Um, Can you talk about Trump's inner circle? You you talk a lot about different people in the White House who tried to work with him. Uh, What would you want to summarize about Trump's inner circle? Well, there's there's a. I think that the the big thing about his inner circle is that they spend much of their time trying to keep up with him. Uh, you know, Trump is the big decision maker. Um, he is, you know, I'd say micromanager, but he doesn't really micromanage. He's more of like the big ultra macro manager. He, he, he swings and he, he makes decisions very quickly and, and, and those around him try to catch up. And I think that sometimes people make a mistake in analyzing some of the people around um, Donald Trump, for instance, uh, his immigration hard line, they'll say, well, that's Stephen Miller. You know, Stephen Miller is the one that does all that. Well, Stephen Miller didn't come on to the Trump campaign until January of 2016. What did Donald Trump do in his first speech when he announced he was running? By the way, five years ago today, um, when he came down the escalator, the mm-hmm. Mexicans, they're rapists, they're druggists, they're bringing it. I mean, 
that that's that was way before Donald Trump had any idea who Stephen Miller was. So, you know, people thought it was all Steve Bannon. This is all Steve Bannon's ideas, all this hyper nationalism. No, Steve Bannon was there and then he was gone and Trump remained the same. Um, so it's what he is in, in a very real sense. Uh, his own chief of staff, his own national security advisor, his own communications director, his own press secretary. That said, um, as I described the evolution of his inner circle, because it, it has changed over time, there, there were people in the very beginning who perhaps, you know, were, were trying to get a hold of all this and trying to steer him and he was listening to. That was the kind of Bannon, Priebus, um, you know, Jared Kushner era, where they're all kind of at war with each other and trying to influence him. That was like the first part of the Trump presidency. And then John Kelly comes in and John Kelly, who has a very tight relationship with, with, uh, with Jim Mattis, um, and also with, with Rex Tillerson, by the way, the, uh, the, the Secretary of State, they kind of have a view that, look, there's a lot of good that Donald Trump can do, but he's also got a lot of self-destructive tendencies. And what we need to do is just try to like stop him from doing the bad stuff and allow the good stuff to, uh, to, to go forward. So they didn't necessarily challenge Trump uh, to his face on a lot of stuff. Um, I, I say that one of the things that, um, that Mattis said to people privately uh, was that Trump was imperi impervious to fact. So you couldn't convince him of something. If he had a wrong idea, there was like no way to get it out of his head. So instead, you would just, you know, if he says something, we'd kind of bury that somewhere, you know, don't follow that order. So I described this. Seen. Now, H.R. McMaster, who was the national security advisor at that time, uh, had a very different view, which is he asked, it's his job to carry out the orders of the commander in chief. And it's also his job to challenge the commander in chief to his face if he thought he was wrong. And if he couldn't carry out the, the order, resign. If not, you carry out ultimately the order. Nobody elected the national security advisor. They elected the president. Um, so I describe a scene in the book where there's a meeting in the Oval Office about the deteriorating situation in Venezuela. And H.R. McMaster is the one there to brief the president. And H.R. McMaster, three-star uh, army general, brilliant guy, but somebody whose style Trump just really didn't like. I mean, he was like a, he, dr Trump saw him almost like a drill sergeant. He came in, rat -a -tat 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 briefings, and Trump doesn't like that. You know, he wants to, he wants to do most of the talking. So, HR is, is given the rundown of what's going on in Venezuela and some of the options to put on additional diplomatic uh, pressure to force Maduro to step down. And Trump just gets it in his head, well, what are our military options? And HR explains, you know, there really aren't, you know, it's not really a military option for, for Venezuela. We've got a whole range of diplomatic tools that we can use, uh, economic tools. And Trump continues to like steam and get get more and more angry as, as the meeting goes on what are our military i want military i want to know what the mil what can we do militarily can we do an embargo can we do that and and uh the meeting ends rather abruptly and hr says yes sir and he goes out leaves the oval office and walks down that hallway uh, towards where the, um, you know, takes to go down one way, take a right to get to the national security uh, uh, advisor's office. And John Kelly hustles after him and says, where are you going? What are you doing? And he said, well, I'm going to carry out an order of the commander in chief. I'm going to tell the Pentagon to work up some plans, some options. And Kelly said, don't do that. Are you crazy? That's going to create a whole, it'll get out in the Pentagon and people think we're actually going to, we're, we're not going to war with Venezuela. It's insane. Just forget you heard that. Don't do it. And it's wild. I mean, I, I actually talked to HR McMaster about that incident and he told me, uh, well, I can't really recall that very specific thing, but things like that happened all the time. Can you imagine? Happened all the time. Mm -hmm. And, you know, John Kelly, I didn't need John Kelly to tell me how to do my job. And it's an extraordinary, actually, bit of, <laughs> of, um, of a response from, from McMaster. But that kind of stuff did happen. He, you know, you had these, these advisors around him who thought that they, and, and I can't tell you how many times this year that I had people tell me over the course of the, the first really two years of the Trump presidency, you think it's crazy what's going on now. 
you should see the stuff that we stop. Mm -hmm. And that was what people like John Kelly thought was their role, was to, was to stop Trump's destructive impulses. It's the whole point of the anonymous op-ed and then book. Mm -hmm. You know, the resistance within the Trump administration you know, we're here, we work for the president, but we're stopping him from doing things that are really bad. Well, I don't think there's any resistance anymore. Exactly. Um, and while it was there, I'm not sure it was really that effective, but, um, but it's so not John, there. John, have you had time to think about the three adjectives that you would use to describe me? And I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to add a little twist to it. Someone asked, do you have anything positive to say? Sure. About Donald Trump? Um, so, um, uh, Look, I'll, I'll do one. To he is charismatic. You, you cannot say he's not charismatic. I mean, he has got the, you know, the world looks at what he's, what is going on. And they may look because they think he's ridiculous or because they think he's brilliant, but people are watching and they're paying attention. He's impulsive. He makes decisions based on the gut. He told me, um, actually he told Barbara Walters back in 1987. I mean, he, this, this is something he's been thinking about for a long time. Barbara Walters said, what is your plan for life? What are your big goals? And he's like, I, like, I really don't have a plan. I, it's like the prize fighters. He said, you go into, when the prize fighter goes into the ring, they say, go with the punches. And Trump's been going with the punches all along. He doesn't have, you know, a 10 part plan of what he's, he, he, he goes uh, with his gut. Um, and um, uh, the, uh, the third is he got a single adjective. It's so, something to do with the fact that he just loves the spotlight. I mean, he wants to be the center at center stage at all times. Mm -hmm. Okay. So um, what about the big picture question? Are you a, um, willing to hazard a, not a prediction, but a, a guess uh, about the reelection and sure. uh, and a question related to that is what you think he will do post-presidency. Okay, so I, I think that first of all, we should be, we should have great humility when trying to figure out what's gonna happen in the 2020 presidential election because everybody got 2016 wrong. So that's my caveat. But I will say, as I mentioned to you earlier, I think that Donald Trump's victory in 2016 was the greatest political upset in the history of American politics. I think that his reelection would be the second biggest upset in the history of American politics. I think he has a lot going against him. I'm not saying he cannot win, um, but he has done virtually nothing to expand the group of people that would support him. He has uh, you know, governed almost entirely focusing in his rhetoric and his actions on those people that already were fervently supportive of himself. So yes, he still has most of those people in his corner. Um, but the population's changed, the demographics have changed. And just from a demographic perspective, the groups of people that more likely are to support Donald Trump have gotten, are, are growing smaller. And the groups of people that are more likely to despise Donald Trump have gotten bigger. Um, so I think that he, and look, all the polling, and I wouldn't want to get, you know, too dependent on polling, but all the polling would suggest the same thing, which is he faces an incredibly, uh, you know, tough, tough reelection fight. Now, people, the answer to that is, oh, well, you know, the polls four years ago showed the same thing. Yeah. And he won the greatest upset in American history. I don't know if you do that twice. I mean, it's going to be a tough race. He's got some advantages he didn't have. He's got all the money in the world, uh, which he did not have last time. He has the total and thorough support of the Republican Party, which he really didn't have last time. Um, and if he doesn't have an access Hollywood situation in the last uh, week of the campaign, you know, <laughs> you'll have that going for him too, but it's going to be a tough reelection. Well, this time around, I hope we get that statistical analysis by that. Yeah. <laughs> who's right. I hope you, you make sure we all hear about that, John. Uh, so I think it's time for our last question. And um, I think I'll just make it the last aspect of that prior question. What do you think that president Trump will do post presidency? What's his future after the White House? Look, I, I, I think that Trump will probably really enjoy himself post-presidency um, if, if he's still healthy and everything else, because he can, he can camp out at Mar-a-Lago. Um, he will still have the megaphone of, of all his social media following. Um, 
you know, he could, he could start his own television network. I'm not sure he'll actually want to do that, but it's certainly an idea that he'll, uh, that he'll look at. It's hard for me to imagine what a Donald Trump presidential library looks like, but I'm sure it'll be unlike any other presidential library we've ever seen. Um, but um, I think that Trump will actually, you know, he, 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 he won't go quietly. This is not going to be a case like George W. Bush or Barack Obama who kind of like try to like fade into the background and not, you know, not interfere. He'll, he'll be, it'll be a loud post-presidency. That's what I would say. <laughs> I don't know if that's good or bad, but I guess we'll see. Uh, so I think we've reached the end of our program time. I want to thank you, John. Uh, and uh, speaking to the audience, our thanks to Jonathan Carl, Chief White House Correspondent and Chief Washington Correspondent for ABC News and author of Front Row at the Trump Show, which is an excellent book. And we encourage you to order your copy today through your local independent bookstores. We also want to express our appreciation to all of our viewers joining us online. The Commonwealth Club has a wide range of virtual programs coming up. So please visit our website for more information. Thanks again, John. Thanks for including me in this program. And, and, and Nasser, let me just say thank you. And I really enjoyed your book. I would not have known about your book if it weren't for Mick Mulvaney. So that's that's one good thing that's uh, that, that's come out of all of this. But I really, I really enjoyed your book and I enjoyed uh, talking to you, um, you know, after uh, as, as I was writing the book and continuing that conversation now. So, uh, so I hope to hope to see you in person uh, before too long. And, and I highly recommend everybody uh, also to read a first rate madness. Thank Thanks, you very John. much. I really appreciate that. And, and thank you to everyone who's uh, online with us. I'm Dr. and turns this program of. Thank you. <laughs>